Thank you. I wish okay. you well. Uh, you, you, too. you too. Thank you. You stay. I'll just take yeah. it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. We'll begin the next session on low-carbon livestock immediately. Um, I think the next event following this begins at 12.15. So we have uh, about an hour and a quarter to get through an hour and a half session. For those who don't know me, my name is Hayden Montgomery. I'm the representative of the Global Research Alliance on Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, and I have the privilege of moderating this next session. Um, to begin, I would like to invite our distinguished panelists to the, to the podium. Uh, first of all, um, our special guest, Thomas Pesquet, uh, is a European astronaut of French nationality. And this is the first time I've had been able to say this in any introduction, recently returned from outer space, <laughs> uh, from a six-month mission aboard the International Space Station. Joining Thomas will be uh, René Castro, the Assistant Director General of FAO, who we've recently heard from in the opening session. Uh, Anne Monte, Livestock Development Officer from the FAO, who's an agronomist working in the field of sustainable livestock development. Welcome, Anne. Uh, Fabiana Vila Alves from Embrapa, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. Uh, Fabiana has a strong scientific background and academic career in, sus in sustainable livestock development. And finally, for the opening panel, uh, Mr. Mark Sadler, if he's here. There he is, uh, from the World Bank and responsible for climate fund management. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, to open this session, we'll have a short video, um, and then we'll invite uh, Thomas to make some reflections. Thank you. My name is Thomas Pesquet, and I lived in outer space for 196 days. For me, it was the most profound life-changing experience. Being so far away and isolated, I needed to share what I saw with those I love most. Our beautiful planet provides us with everything we need to grow food and live healthy lives. But climate change and extreme weather are putting everything at risk, damaging agriculture and destroying the livelihoods of those who grow our food. Every day, 815 million people go to bed on an empty stomach. And we still waste one third of all the food we produce. My journey in space made me realize even more that we need to stand together and act now. We only have one Earth and every action counts. Do your part to achieve zero hunger. Would you like to provide some reflections from you know, what it's like to watch us from out there and uh, how fragile this planet is from so many miles away? Thank you. You can take the podium or, or from the chair. Thank you. All right, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, so as you saw in the video, um, my name is Thomas Pesquet. I had the privilege of spending 196 days on the, on the International Space Station from November of last year to uh, June. Uh, of this year. So on the ISS, uh, my, my mission is all about research. We use the ISS as a platform uh, which enables discoveries that couldn't be made on the ground in so many different domains, medicine, technology, material science, uh, physics, biology. There's a few experiments on the, on the climate and earth science, but by far and large, it's not the majority. ESA, on the other hand, the European Space Agency, uh, is a, ma a major actor of earth observation. Uh, and of all the climate variables, as you very well know, more than half are observable only from space. So sea level, sea temperatures and currents, greenhouse gases, uh, the ozone, cloud cover, uh, land use, land humidity, you name it, uh, they're all measured from space. Um, but what we do have on the space station, however, that the satellites don't have, um, is that we have a window, a window on the world. We're in a very special position. We're in a position to observe the Earth and to take a step back, 450 kilometers altitude for six months, uh, it's an incredibly vantage point 
And most of the astronauts, they experience what is being called the, the overview effect. And what does that mean? Uh, it just means that some of the phenomena, if not all of them that are happening on, on Earth, like climate change, happen on such a global scale that it's really, really difficult to encompass them um, from here. You can understand them, you can reason, you can do math, um, it's all meaningful, but you can't really experience them. And when you go to space, you have this, this huge step back and suddenly um, you can experience them with your feelings. You can see them happening um, in real time. So you're being given a chance if you want to look uh, to experience them firsthand. So one striking fact uh, is how fragile the, the Earth looks like. Uh, from here on the ground, it can seem very permanent uh, and too big to be harmed almost. But from space, I guarantee you, it's incredibly fragile. It's just a big blue ball, a blue oasis of life, and there's just nothing around. It's emptiness, darkness for millions of light years. Um, what, what struck me as first as well is how thin and fragile the atmosphere looks like, like you can see on that picture on the upper right corner. Uh, this is everything. This is the difference between life and death for all of us. All of us. And it's incredibly fragile. It's thin. It looks like a balloon, like it could be punctured any time. And this is all we have uh, to take care of us and to protect us from the hardships um, of space. So, and then I started to look out the window. And on a global scale, um, when you look at continents, you, s you can see different landscapes. You can see the seas, you can see the deserts, you can see the forest, uh, you can see lakes, um, and you can see just a huge diversity of, uh, of our planet's landscape. Uh, and then I started looking closer. And when you look closer, you could distinguish the rivers, their deltas, lakes, and sometimes natural boundaries, sometimes administrative boundaries. Um, and then I took an even closer look. Um, and by zooming in one step further, I could clearly see cities regional areas, man-made structures like the Suez Canal that you can see on the right of that picture. And I, I started to understand how the human activity and very often agriculture shape the landscape they belong to. At my maximum level of magnification, you can see the pyramids right there in the middle of this picture. Um, I was clearly seeing fields, individual fields, roads, structures, um, almost all the details of man's use of their environment. And I was just, just like that, constantly traveling between a global scale where I could see the, the, the huge phenomenon and a very local scale where I could see man's impact on its environment almost at an individual level. Um, I could unfortunately also witness the destructive power of nature. Uh, there was a few hurricanes during my mission uh, in the Caribbean, but not only in some of the areas of the world as well. Um, too often I could see the negative impacts of uh, man's use of its environment, of man activities. I could see uh, pollution in the river deltas. In the river deltas, I could spot forest clearings uh, in the Amazon along the rivers. All this is clearly visible from the International Space Station. Uh, in some areas, I, was, I started to question um, the, use, the use of land. Some areas are very irrigated, like on this picture in Arizona, uh, in a desert. Uh, in, some of the, in some of the places, there's no irrig irrigation at all whatsoever. And I started wondering why. Um, I could see the very distinctive patterns of agriculture along the riverbeds in some dry areas. And in some other areas, agriculture was almost at an indi industrial level uh, with huge fields extending as far as the eye could see. Uh, so during the entire mission, I grew more and more sensitive to the environment uh, and the protection of our whole planet. I had in my luggage a copy of the, the Paris Agreement that I took with me as a symbol uh, that the role space has to play in the protection of the Earth. Also, I was speaking daily on the IP phone uh, with someone that is very close to me and uh, is sitting right here working for FAO. And we started discussion, discussing the actions being taken on the ground. And I was questioning, comparing what I was seeing daily to what was being done. And as she was traveling all around the world with FAO, Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, to try and implement some very concrete solutions. We constantly had this, this back and forth. And I wanted to re reconcile my vision of the planet and the problems I could see with what was being done uh, on the ground. So this is really the reason of my presence today here at COP23. Um, first of all, I want to testify the fragility of the Earth. It's something to understand it, but believe me, uh, to see it with your own eyes, it, it makes you realize in a very, very strong way 
uh, how fragile the Earth is and how much we need to protect it. And, and secondly, I want to confront my vision and what I saw from the space station to all the initiatives being taken on the ground. Uh, and I want somehow to challenge what, what people are doing, what the FAO, what other agencies, what all the stakeholders are doing. I want to initiate a healthy discussion and uh, urge people to do even more. Thank you. Merci, Thomas. Uh, the next speaker will be Mr. René Salazar, the FAO Assistant Director General. René, the floor is yours. Excuse me, uh, Thomas, but I, I have to go out of the script with the little description you just did. You know, he mentioned, like, in a second, when Anne was in doing her work, out there in Ethiopia. I was communicating with her from the International Space Agency, you know, and we shared what she was doing in the field, and I was seeing in, in, in the uh, you know, International Space Station. And then they talked when she was in Panama or somewhere else. And that's... Uh, also why we invited them here. Not to share a love story, which <laughs> is good in itself, but also it's, it's important what is happening in the field and what, ki what can we see as the trends at the global level, that you can even see them, picture them, monitor them. And this is part of our work at, at, at FAO. And thank you for sharing your personal, I'm sorry to expose you, but I think this is also relevant for, for the people to know. You know, yes, our planet is fragile and climate change affects agriculture. And livestock are key to food security and nutrition, providing 34 of global protein and a wide range of essential nutrients and other goods and services. But hundreds of millions of small livestock keepers and pastoralists already suffer from the impact of droughts, floods, and other climate shocks. Ladies and gentlemen, since the beginning of agriculture, domestic animals have turned resources that humans can use directly into food, energy, fertilizer, and money. But today, the demand for meat, milk, and eggs is exceeding what can be produced without putting significant pressure on natural resources. Indeed, the livestock sector is the largest user of agricultural land with pastures and feed crops. Livestock emit more greenhouse gas than most other food sources. In particular, ruminants contribute to 30% of total anthropogenic methane emissions, a gas that traps more heat than carbon dioxide after it is released into the air. Some people say about 21 times. Today, there is a highly polarized debate around livestock production and consumption. The debate focuses on the role of livestock products in achieving food security and health and healthy diets, while managing sustainably natural resources and tackling climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, FAO is working on solutions. Low carbon livestock production is possible. We are encouraged by progress made in many parts of the world. It's important to stress that there are co-benefits between adaptation and mitigation in the agricultural sector. Efficiency gains to reduce emissions intensity as well as carbon sequestration in soils contribute to enhance resilience to climate shocks. Today we will hear about these solutions and from examples of how they are applied in practice FAO is helping countries achieving low-carbon livestock by generating knowledge, 
developing tools and protocols, piloting projects and facilitating multi-stakeholder partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 13 years to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and a similarly short time frame to stabilize global average temperature to save levels as requested by the Paris Agreement. Can we do it? 92 developing countries have included livestock in their national determined contributions, the NDCs, and 78% of the NDCs are linked to the SDG 2 of ending hunger. It's time to act. And developing low carbon and climate resilient livestock is a fundamental part of the solution. Today, the policy dialogue on this debate can help to find the right place for livestock in achieving healthy diets for all in changing climate. From these people, I've been learning that it's possible. You will hear from them challenges, ideas, projects, examples. Let's take advantage to question them if we have the time. Thank you. Thank you, René. So we've heard recently that 92 uh, developing country NDCs include livestock. So now let's hear what the options are for these countries in order to actually reduce emissions. So I'd now like to invite uh, Anne Monte to give us a presentation uh, on low carbon livestock. What are the options? Anne, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, so. I'm going to try and be short here, but it's important to have um, the options in mind before we go to the different countries and, and the different stakeholders that we have invited today to give uh, testimonies of what's happening on the ground. And that's the topic of this presentation. Um, it's not only me. Eh? I put another, uh, another, some other names on the, on the first slide here. I would like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors uh, from FAO and outside FAO as well. And uh, if you're interested, we put those solutions in this little brochure here, uh, you can find some at the entrance of the room. So before we look into those emissions from livestock and, and what mitigation is, it's important to remember, as René said, um, the role of livestock for food security and nutrition. Uh, it's a key role. 34% uh, of, of protein for meat, milk, and eggs, uh, but a bunch of other uh, contributions to, for example, macronutrients, and some of them are essentials and that are uh, difficult to find on plant-based diet only, especially for uh, children and pregnant women, as we know now. Um, an important fact to remember is also how livestock produces uh, all those, uh, those macronutrients and, and protein as well um, by using things that we cannot eat as humans, byproducts, crop residues, grass. Uh, so turning those um, unedible products for us into uh, high quality protein that is edible for us. Um, their contribution also uh, is to uh, the production of manure for, fertiliz for fertilization of crop fields, uh, but also traction, drop power to plow those fields. Uh, and livestock products can generate income for families uh, in order to buy food as well. So contribution directly and indirectly to food security and nutrition. Of course, we have to talk about the feed food competition, uh, which is a negative contribution of livestock to, to food security. Uh, as we know, livestock is using uh, also products that are directly edible, uh, such as cereals. Uh, but another indirect contribution is to uh, what we call women empowerment. For example, if you look at the dairy sector, we know that about one farm out of four, one out of, uh, uh, of four dairy farms in the world are, uh, are led by a woman. And uh, it's very important uh, in food security and nutrition at household level to empower women, as we know. So those emissions, um, FAO estimates that uh, emissions from livestock uh, supply chains at global level account for about 14% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, when we say 14%, uh, we don't only look at enteric methane, the purple uh, uh, part of this chart here, uh, which, are the, which is the, the methane released by rumination uh, during the digestive process of, of, of livestock, uh, or the emissions from manure, but also the emissions associated with producing the forage and, and the feed crops, and emissions downstream after, uh, after the farm gate. So it's, it's really here a life cycle assessment. It's considering all the processes that go into livestock production and what they emit as greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, 
some scientists uh, from uh, working for the Global Research Alliance, for example, here in this chart, they've looked at the contribution of, of um, those emissions to the warming of the atmosphere. So here we have uh, a model uh, increase of temperature according to uh, historical levels of uh, greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And if we remove uh, the enteric methane, we see that we reduce this, this, this warming potential. And removing also, um, um, the, the two other gases, uh, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, from, from the total, we see that, well, the contribution of livestock to, to the global warming of, of, of the Earth is, is, is significant. So now looking at the options, what can we do? Um, we have three big uh, strategies uh, that we'd like to uh, discuss today. Uh, the first one uh, is trying to increase, further increase uh, livestock productivity uh, and the efficiency uh, of farms in using natural resources uh, by using practices and technologies uh, direct and, uh, that already exist, but also technologies, as we will see, that uh, seek to reduce directly emissions, for example, enteric methane. We're going to look also at uh, soil carbon sinks, in particular in pastures. Uh, and how reducing waste and uh, the better integration of livestock in what we call the circular bioeconomy can also contribute to, to reduce their contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, a fourth strategy uh, is looking at the demand side of the question and reducing meat consumption where uh, it's um, important, too high, uh, also for healthy reasons, for health reasons, human health reasons. So uh, we're not going to focus on this today. Uh, we're going to focus on the production side. Uh, but let's bear, keep in mind that uh, in situations where we have overconsumptions of meat, uh, some reduction can also contribute to environmental uh, benefits and health benefits. So the first option, um, increasing efficiency, increasing productivity. Uh, at FAO, we estimate with our partners that um, we can reduce emissions from livestock by 20-30% by improving the efficiency of livestock production. And when we look at uh, the history of livestock production, for example, in Asia, we see that it's already the case. Uh, productivity is already increasing, uh, and the emission intensity, uh, is, this is what we call emissions per kilogram of products, emissions per kilogram of meat or milk, is decreasing over time, as you can see. Um, and well, how can we do that? Using basically best practices and technologies uh, at animal level, but also at herd level. Uh, that means, for example, improving the feed quality or um, chopping some crop residues before feeding them to livestock, uh, better um, uh, caring for the animals and um, you know, um, uh, their health, uh, this trying to uh, anticipate animal diseases uh, and, and, and treatments, for example. And this is also relevant at herd level. If you have a herd that is more productive, for example, if cows have a higher fertility, then uh, you're more productive at herd level. Uh, the important thing is that uh, those options, they're relevant for all systems of production, whether you're um, a dairy farmer, a uh, poultry farmer, small scale, large scale, uh, you can always improve your productivity. There are very strong synergies uh, between productivity and increasing food security, obviously, but also increasing farmers' incomes and also the overall system resilience. If you produce more with less, you're less vulnerable to climate shocks. Uh, one important thing to consider also is that where in cases, in, in, in regions where livestock production is relatively static, which is the case, for example, in Europe, to reduce emission intensity per unit of product uh, will result in reducing absolute emissions. But in regions of the world where livestock is growing, and uh, in particular in developing countries, uh, while reducing emission intensity per unit of product will reduce emissions below uh, the level of business as usual, but not overall emissions. So this is important to keep in mind. And we also have direct mitigation options, uh, vaccines uh, against uh, enteric um, methane emissions, uh, breeding for uh, low methane uh, sheep, for example. They, are, they exist, they're available, and there are different levels of implementation at the moment. Uh, but uh, this is also um, uh, high potential uh, options. And just to cite one example of what is being done in practice, FAO is working uh, with the New Zealand uh, Centre for Greenhouse Gas Emissions, uh, funded by the Climate and Clean uh, Air Coalition, in 13 countries, um, in three different regions, to, uh, in practice, reduce uh, emissions by improving uh, productivity. 
The second option, if you remember, was uh, soil carbon sequestration. Uh, this is a very specific thing to agriculture, in particular livestock with the, the, the billion of hectares, billions of hectares of pasture that livestock is, is using in the world. Uh, only in the agricultural sector uh, can we think about uh, how we can remove naturally carbon from the atmosphere, and this is, this is a very uh, important option for, for agriculture to look at. Uh, but there are challenges uh, also because uh, we, we still have very large gaps of knowledge on how management practices, in particular on pastures, can result in storing more carbon in the soils. For example, uh, restoring the quality of degraded pastures, rotational grazing, uh, integration of pastures and trees. Uh, we have uh, case studies at local level, but we still miss the bigger picture, uh, and, and, and we're still working on this. Uh, the quantification is, is, is challenging. We have small changes in carbon sto stocks versus large, and we have also a problem of persistence. Uh, you have to keep implementing those practices if you want the carbon stocks to remain in the soils. And the last option um, is this story about circular bioeconomy. Uh, what do we mean? Um, well, basically, if you look at the right side of this slide, you see everything that livestock eat. Uh, there's a large share of grass and leaves, the green part. You see in yellow also 20% of the dry matter intake of livestock is crop residues, straws, uh, after, after crop harvest. And those are materials that we cannot eat directly as humans. So um, the idea behind the circular bioeconomy is, is to improve, to enhance uh, the share of those materials that we cannot consume as humans uh, in in the livestock feed ration. And on the other side, it's also to recycle uh, the energy and the nutrients uh, that are wasted in livestock production to the production of manure when it's not uh, used as, for, uh, as fertilizer. So we're thinking here, for example, of biogas production. Uh, this integration uh, can happen at different uh, scales. It can happen on farm, by using the manure on the crops, by feeding the straw to the livestock, but it can also hap uh, happen at uh, supply chain level. We can use, for example, the whey, uh, that is a byproduct of the dairy production, to feed pigs, for example. Um, of course, there are limits to, to, to a better integration of livestock in the circular bioeconomy. Um, some externalities of lesser production are not priced at the moment. Uh, there are also some policies that uh, don't um, don't uh, help uh, farmers uh, moving into the right direction that give that we call perverse incentives towards using, for example, um, synthetic fertilizers instead of manure. And there are also a need, there's also a need for adequate policies, uh, especially in the in the field of public health. So to summarize, um, I think what we need to remember before we start discussing uh, the, the different uh, country level implementation, um, it's that livestock is very important in the, in the context of climate change because it's first uh, the source of livelihoods and resilience for hundreds of millions of small uh, farmers and, and pastoralists uh, who are very much exposed and vulnerable to, li to, to, to climate change, but also because livestock is an important contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we know that low carbon is possible, that solutions exist, and that uh, we already what they are. We already know what they are. Some require a little bit more uh, research for implementation, but they are available. Uh, and we also know that most of the time, these options uh, also result in reducing the vulnerability of livestock and uh, farmers to climate change. So we have very strong synergies between uh, mitigation and adaptation. And finally, what we, what we know and that we, what we're going to see is that we need concerted action uh, and, and that we don't have blanket solutions. We need to uh, use different types of solutions, mix uh, efficiency and carbon storing, for example, as a basket of approach uh, to get the, the best results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for that overview of the the range of mitigation options available for, for livestock. I recall a piece of work done by, I think, CCAF scientists and some, some folks involved in the GRA that showed that um, with current known practices, even implemented fully at scale, we can only get to between 21 and 40 percent of the mitigation required by the agriculture sector as a, as a whole uh, to be consistent with, say, the two-degree goal of the Paris Agreement. So. Um, you know, I think there's no excuse for us to, um, to not adopt the practices we know, given that, as you pointed out, there are so many synergies with farmer income and food security and resilience. But what we certainly need on top of that is, is more, right? We need more options, not just the, the sort of the basket of options we, we know about today. 
Right, now let's move to the country level. Let's hear from uh, Fabiana uh, from Embrapa, and she'll present to us about options for low carbon beef production in Brazil. Fabiana, the floor is yours. Thank you, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the invitation, Mr. René, and, and I will try to show you uh, what Brazil is trying to do uh, in a local, low carbon um, livestock change in a better, for a better climate change scenario. Okay. Okay, Brazil is one of the most important food producers in the world and we provide almost 40% of all global beef. In fact, beef supply chain is very important to the country economy, and it's concentrated in the Midwest of Brazil, in the Brazilian savanna region. About 95% of the herd is raised on pastures of bracara grass, and only three to 5% of the total amount of beef production comes from intensive systems like feedlot. But what you are really doing to transform the world way, way of do into a sustainable way of do? Everyone knows that Brazil is one of the more investors on decarbonization of agriculture. Even we have until, although few, situations like this showed in the picture. For example, we have about 69% of all territory covered by forests, natives and cultivated. But we have also about 50, 60 million of acres with degraded pastures that, when recovered, emit less GHG, due also to the less time that cattle stay on the area until slaughter. So, the decarbonization of tropical agriculture grows through the use of the best farming practices, like improved farms, use of calcium, limestone, and nitrogen fertilizers in the pastures, use of crossbreeding, among others. The potential to remove carbon dioxide of the atmosphere only using this practice in Brazil it's about 180 million of tons of carbon dioxide per year. In the last three decades, no model of agricultural production has advanced as fast in the direction of sustainability as the Brazil one. Large part of this change is due to the massive pressuring by his beef buyers, but also by consumers. Curiously, when you talk about GEGs and its effects on the environment, contrary as we could imagine, a recent study made by University of Edinburgh, Scotland Rural College, and Brazil Agricultural Research Corporation, BRAPA, and published in the journal Natural Climate Change, shows that the simplistic approach, less beef, for more world sustainability, maybe it's not the right way to cope with the problem in our livestock production systems. All that I said until now is called the tropical sustainable intensification, and Brazil leads a major effort to generate and to promote the use of land sparing technologies. This is the base for an immigration of the production systems based on their horizontal, horizontal expansion come in the past to a vertical expansion movement. If you take a look for the seven lines of actuation of the governmental program for the greenhouse gases mitigations, the program ABC, a Brazilian government program, integrated systems is one of that is growing more importance in Brazil. 
Nowadays, Brazil has about 11 and a half million actors under integrated systems, and Mato Grosso do Sul State, where Embrapa Beef Cattle is based, has the biggest area with this kind of production systems. One thing, one thing that I would like to highlight is that the benefits of the systems go beyond reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I will see to one, thermal comfort, so important to grass-fed beef production in the tropics. In this picture, we can see what I have just talked. Realize that there is a reduction of up to 55% in GAG emissions using a smallest area in this kind of systems. We have a lot of other field studies where we try to know more about the benefits of the use of the integrated systems to produce beef, a sustainable beef. This is a recent study, it has just been published, that shows the LCA of one of the biggest farms of Brazil, Ipameri Farm, that uses the integrated systems. Here we have a proof that also the producers is open to innovation. Thus, in 2012, after almost 40 years studying the various scenarios and aspects of integrated systems, we launched a brand, a concept brand. The major goal of this initiative is to crystallize in a seal two concepts. One, that you can produce a meat that has its carbon emissions neutralized by the trees of the systems. And two, that all this can be done with a high level of a well farm animal. Thus, carbon neutral Brazilian beef is a new concept for sustainable beef production in the tropics, developed by Embrapa. Actually, it is the only initiative in Brazil for beef production that follows the precepts of MRV mechanism with measuring, reporting, and verification, essential for the carbon credits market. The carbon neutral Brazilian beef has initiated at Mato Grosso do Sul State in a pilot project into one of the biggest farm of the state, Grupo Mutum, and nowadays we have other 10 pilot projects over four biome of Brazil. So, it's all. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. And you've introduced another option, which I, to me is this decoupling idea. So in addition to the options that Anne presented uh, in terms of increasing productivity and efficiency, uh, direct reductions, uh, reducing waste, and the demand side, we now have this, this link to land use more broadly with forestry, so I think it's a very important uh, thing to bear in mind. Right, the final speaker for this part of the panel is Mr. Mark Sadler from the World Bank, and he will present to us about investment opportunities in low-carbon livestock in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Mark, the floor is yours. Good morning. Welcome to Ag Day, which is actually only the second one. The first one was in uh, was in Morocco. So it's good that we're getting uh, our rightful place uh, on the podium at COP. Um, so it's the second time I've spoken after an astronaut. So, um, but it's the first time I've spoken after an astronaut about poop. Uh, and really, that's kind of the space that we're in. Um, and very quickly, before talking about, I think, the reason that the World Bank were asked, we would come and talk about money. Uh, but just before we get to that, we, we had some interesting conversations uh, yesterday at the, Nordic <coughs> at the Nordic event. But I think it's really important that we position livestock and this discussion in the right space. Yes, this is a sector that's accountable for about 14% of total GHG emissions. That's huge. That starts making it look like transport. 
But when it came to transport, we didn't say people should stop moving around. What we did is we invented, we drove a transformation into low carbon transport. We now have electric vehicles. These things are now in the mainstream. So I urge us all not to get into that conversation, which is we all stop eating meat. Because the reality is that an agricultural sector, sustainable agricultural sector, doesn't work unless there are animals in it. It's an incredibly important part of a functioning ecosystem. And secondly, let's also be very clear about the difference between what is a northern issue and southern potential. So the vast increase in protein consumption that we are seeing is occurring in countries uh, that were and still are developing. And this meat, this protein, is being consumed by people who have suffered from malnutrition for decades and generations. Uh, in, uh, for example, the Mekong Delta, uh, new malnutrition incidence in under fives is over 20%, and that is the rice bowl of the world. But the kids there actually consume 2,000 calories of rice a day. That is not a balanced diet. Of course, munching down on burgers is also not a balanced diet. But I think we do need to be very clear and very careful about excessive consumption, whatever that may be defined as, uh, of animal protein in the north versus the introduction of healthy amounts of animal protein in diets in the south. So it's not a question of don't do it, it's a question of how do we end up with an electric car uh, in livestock? How do we do it better? Um, and you know, speaking after a uh, pr presentation from Brazil, it's almost a question of, well, what have I got left to say? I mean, Brazil is a, a, a phenomenal example with the ABC, uh, the new forest code, uh, and um, soy moratorium, I mean, the list goes on, of how you can actually start moving in that direction. But I think what we're hearing and what we're seeing, and the reality is as well, is that it will take an integrated uh, approach to the problem. It does mean that we need to look at deforestation. It does mean that we need to look at, at sustainable intensification uh, of livestock as opposed to extensification, which of course is driving the land use change, which we simply cannot as a planet afford. So that being said, I wanted to, to quickly talk to you about some examples of how at the bank we're, we're, we are starting to move uh, and uh, starting to develop some more integrated approaches uh, to large livestock scale projects um, and how we're trying to bring together this integration. So uh, the, the first example, I guess, really uh, came with Niger and Kenya, which were actually coming from Climate Smart Ag projects really were seeking uh, to bring in not only um, uh, different approaches, but also community uh, level up. And Niger uh, and Kenya were actually projects that were designed at the community level up, uh, very much with uh, the local communities deciding on, out of a package of approaches, what would actually make sense and how do you put it together. Um, in that project, we uh, didn't start looking at actual uh, emissions as it related to livestock, but we did actually start including outcome indicators that related to intensity, emissions intensity of livestock production. Uh, we've got a large project that's now actually coming together. I'm not going to give any numbers on these ones because these haven't gone to the board yet. But um, where in, in the Ethiopia project, we're actually looking uh, at, at a mitigation target, dangerous word, but a mitigation indicator in livestock in, under that project, where we're actually looking at a reduction in GHG uh, intensity, uh, emission intensity in livestock of around 30%. Uh, as anyone who knows Ethiopia uh, well will appreciate, the fundamental importance of a growing livestock sector for the country, uh, but also the importance, therefore, of doing that in a very sustainable way. Uh, it's also uh, the first project where we've actually been able to align uh, both an, an agricultural investment project, uh, but also the work of one of the biocarbon funds, which happens to be working in Oromia region. Uh, in that situation, 
we, we can't actually be looking at uh, carbon payments um, because at the moment, uh, only em absolute emission reductions are considered by most carbon funds. So when we're looking at emission intensity, that wouldn't actually be covered by an emission reduction agreement. But of course, what we're actually doing is we're looking at a situation where business as usual expansion of livestock would actually lead to a dramatic increase in GHG emissions uh, versus the project, which will actually uh, whilst lead to a net increase. That increase will be a lot lower than it would have been if we'd used business as usual. And uh, a new project, uh, in actual fact, uh, in Bangladesh, where um, it's a very large scale one, um, but uh, not only bringing in indicators that re relate to GHG emission intensity, um, but potentially also the ability to uh, connect this with uh, carbon payments. And there the connection's really coming from a challenge that I gave the team about a year ago, which was, uh, sounded a bit crazy to them at the time, but looks like it's now doable, which was give me an off-grid dairy. Access to energy in Bangladesh is an enormous challenge. Uh, it's a driver of, of rural uh, poverty and con continued social uh, issues. But as the sector grows, and as the demand in Bangladesh grows, especially uh, both, both for milk and meat, um, what we are suddenly creating, of course, is a huge energy potential uh, in exactly those places where energy is not currently able to access. And so through the use of biogas, um, and you know, what we've seen in biodigesters is a dramatic change in both uh, the unit cost, but also their efficiency and the reduction in leakage um, but also the potential for solar. So what we're really pushing for uh, in Bangladesh is, as we would call it, an off-grid dairy. What that does, of course, is it slightly revolutionizes the situation whereby uh, traditionally dairies and the ability to drive infrastructure and cold chains has been heavily connected to your ability to access energy. Our argument is that the energy is there, we're just not using it. Uh, and uh, what that actually does is then enable us to start accounting on a project basis, and the Biocarbon Fund actually uh, has and works in exactly that space, where we actually look at a landscape or a jurisdiction, and you start actually uh, accounting across the jurisdiction. And that very much has to be the way that we move forwards with livestock. Because if we're not taking into account the other parts of the system, then we're not truly accounting for livestock uh, in the way that it can and must be done. Because if we do that, we actually start bringing in the incentives, the drivers, and the land use planning that it will require uh, to move livestock forwards. And on that note, um, I'll let you move on. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for introducing more complexity into the question of uh, livestock. I mean, I think you've raised some really important issues around the ecosystem, the role of animals in those ecosystems, and the energy agriculture interface, which you know, is another option you know, beyond what Anne's presented, the, the link to forestry, also thinking about the link between food and energy. Uh, often thinking about it that way doesn't always fit well with the, uh, the accounting approaches that we're also fond of in this process. So I think it's going to require some some perhaps some rethinking about how we actually design these projects and what is um, considered to be legitimate in terms of mitigation. And I think your examples about the business as usual and the, and the intensity type approach is absolutely fundamental to make some progress in, in agriculture and livestock in particular. Right, so that brings us to the end of this, um, this panel session. But I'd like to ask, perhaps rather than dismissing some of our panelists, maybe we just ask the others to join because I think there is space. Uh, on the on the podium. So I'd now like to invite um, Ruth Hack. Um, she's a sheep farmer from Germany. She had the privilege of working on farms in New Zealand and Australia and now runs an organic farm. And she represents uh, the German Organization of Shepherds and will speak for pastoralists here today. Ruth, welcome. Uh, also Maria sanchez Maina from the International Dairy Federation. Uh, she's a veterinarian with a PhD in bioengineering sciences and she works on animal health and welfare, environment and public health for the International Dairy Federation. And finally, Mr. but not least, of course, Mr. Fritz Schneider. Uh, he's the chair of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. 
He was a professor on livestock systems at Bern University and extensively involved in major international publications on livestock and environment. So we've heard from, um, well, an astronaut. Um, we've heard from uh, international organizations and, and public sector. And now it's a chance to hear from the livestock sector representatives. Um, I'm going to begin by giving the floor to Ruth. Um, and I'd like to know, well, first of all, if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to, to, to pose those questions. But also I'd like to hear from you, you know, in terms of being a pastoralist, working with animals, what, is, what does this challenge of climate change mean for you? And how can you be sure that your voice is being heard in all this, uh, in this conversation, uh, the likes of which we, uh, we hear in Bonn? Thank you. Thank you. To give a voice to the pastoralists. I'm a German shepherd, and if you go out and see a shepherd with his herd in the field, you, it might seem first very romantic, and it might give the impression that's a backward thing. But really, it's a very modern thing because in order to go long distances with our animals to find the food, we are used to adapt always to new situations so we can adapt to the climate change. But in German, a shepherd can't live from his income of the sheep 30 years ago we could, but now a sheep, if I sell a lamb, it, it, it hardly uh, covers the costs to keep the mother sheep. Now the income is one part money from the EU, which all farmers get, and another part is local money to keep the environment. But this is not enough to encourage young people to go, to go ahead with this way of life. The average of a shepherd in Germany and also in Europe is 56 years. So in ten, if the things doesn't change in 10 years, in about 10 years, there will be a big change. Hmm? We should be paid for our services because we are agroecological service providers. We keep the landscape, we keep the biodiversity, and we produce good meat where no machine can go. And this is for the sheep in Germany. This is for the camels in India and for all the others, for the yaks in the Himalaya, for the reindeer near the North Pole, for the cows in Africa. We all feed our animals on grass where no machine can harvest and where no machine can go, and on grass and leaves where no person can eat. And the climate change adds another problem to what we have here in Germany, to our bureaucracy, and the predators which are coming. Uh, but we can face it if, it if it is an income for our families. So what would mean climate change for the others in Europe and the world? There, the situation is much more dramatic. In many parts of the world, the access to land and water for the pastoral lessons is less is getting less and less. And also the migration routes are cut off and I can't go where they have to go to feed their animals. And as the climate changes, they even have to go more distances to find food, to find the necessary food to feed their animals. And if they can't, the pastoralists, the pastoralists don't have enough income, and very often they even don't have enough to eat. 
and how I ca can we get our voice heard? First thing is to organize ourselves. This can be on the local level. In Germany, we, we've been going together, the German shepherds in the, in the German shepherd professional, uh, yeah, the German shepherd professional. A few years ago, we, we get together in an organization. So we got more attention in policy and more attention also in the media, in the newspapers, radio, in TV. And that was a great progress for us because before, sometimes, we seem to be very often forgotten. And of another thing what we are doing is to go together on the European level because most laws are made in Brussels and there are much laws uh, to take away the rights, our rights, and, and uh, yes. And we have also too much bureaucracy. And we need less, less regulations. And the next thing to do is to give the European Shepherd Network a legal form, and we need the support to do this the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and um, some really good examples there, building on what Mark mentioned about the role of livestock and ecosystems, um, absolutely clear in your presentation. And also the issue of the age of farmers. Uh, I think you said 56 years average age in Germany. It wouldn't be much different in New Zealand, perhaps, perhaps even older, and, and the same in many countries, which is an issue facing the sector for sure. Um, okay, now I'd like to um, ask Maria to address us. Um, Maria, as far as I understand, the International Dairy Federation represents about three quarters of global milk production. Um, I'd like to hear what the sustainable development agenda means for IDF, um, and also what IDF can do or is doing to contribute to making possible this low uh, emissions livestock future that we're talking about today. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, as you said, the dairy industry represents one billion people, and there are six billion consumers of dairy products. So last year, in 2016, the dairy sector committed itself, uh, together with the FAO, to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by signing the Dairy Declaration. Um, this Dairy Declaration has now been signed by 20 IDF member countries, and we expect that many more are going to sign it. The goal of the dairy sector is to continuously improve and uh, to deliver for healthy people and on a healthy planet, working on livelihoods, on nutrition, on the environment, working on the economies, on women empowerment. We are aware that the climate, sec that the climate change is there. We are responsible for methane emissions and as well for manure. And we are also being affected by climate change. So the dairy cattle is affected currently mainly because of heat stress. We are suffering um, decreased milk yields. Uh, of course, it affects cow comfort. We have most pests and diseases. Uh, the dairy feed supply is affected as well. And it is also getting more difficult to um, manage the manure in heat and warm extreme conditions. So the dairy sector is, is fully aware of the climate change and is really committed to reduce the emissions. And this is what we have done with the dairy declaration. And I'm just going to brief you what we are doing. So there are currently many initiatives already in place in many regions and countries. For example, there's an industry um, industry-wide approach, voluntarily taken by, by many dairy industries. For example, in the US, the dairy industry has committed itself to reduce 25% of greenhouse emissions by 2020 from the baseline of 2007. And many other countries are doing the same. I work for the International Dairy Federation, which is a, a science-based organization um, that supports the dairy sector and, and helps the dairy sector progress. One of the pillars of our work is dairy sustainability. 
And uh, at currently, the dairy sector is at the forefront on aligning on uh, carbon footprint calculations. Um, with the work of experts, scientific experts in the IDF, we publish a, a, a document, it's a guide, that uh, allows the dairy sector to measure the carbon footprint of dairy products. Um, this document is aligned with many other standards that are in place and as well with the work of the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock, with the LEAP uh, project coordinated by the FAO, and uh, it is also aligned with the Dairy Sustainability Framework. This is an initiative of which IDF is one of the mem uh, fund um, member founders. We are also working a lot in uh, water because we know that water is essential to life and it's also essential for farming and our aim is to reduce the water use. So we have recently also published a guidance document for the dairy sector to calculate the water footprint of products. So it helps the users to identify hotspots of water use and to, to measure some progress indicators on water use and consumption. We are also working on biodiversity because we are aware that dairy affects biodiversity. And uh, from the IDF, we are trying to help the dairy sector understand how dairy is um, having an impact on the biodiversity. How can we stay within the ecological limits of the landscape? And as well, how, how dairy can benefit the, the, the ecosystems because this is possible. We also have some projects uh, in the IDF, in the Federation, to optimize um, the environmental performance at processing and at transport level. And we are also aware that we need to work on uh, carbon soil sequestration, and this needs like, war it warrants more research on this. So overall, I just can say that the dairy sector is um, fully committed to achieve uh, nutrition, uh, to provide nutrition in a sustainable manner to nourish the world and that we are fully aware of, uh, of climate change and of the possibilities and, and, and options for mitigation. mitigation. Thank you, Maria. And we certainly need um, the likes of IDF and other industry organizations to be absolutely leading uh, in this challenge. Fritz, I'll turn to you now. You're chair of a multi-stakeholder platform, so you're working with the government uh, representatives, you're working with uh, civil society, and you're working with industry bodies and that platform. Maybe you can share with us some of the action and, and sort of efforts that you're seeing from that platform uh, on the ground um, and, and you know, the contribution they, those actions are making to to reducing emissions from, from livestock, but also contributing to that broader uh, sustainable de development agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Before I uh, answer directly the question, maybe I put the global agenda for sustainable livestock into context. FAO is a group, a rather uh, informal group, called uh, the Livestock and Environment in Development Group, uh, started its work uh, in the late 90s and came out with a publication, uh, Livestock's Long Shadow, in 2005, which showed the greenhouse gas emissions, and that created a lot of uh, havoc in the livestock sector because uh, many people thought it was uh, too negative. Then uh, this work went on to 2010, when the Committee of Agriculture of FAO asked FAO to develop a global agenda for sustainable livestock. And uh, I have the honor to chair this uh, uh, agenda now, and I'm very happy to show you a little bit what we are doing. It's actually a, a voluntary organization. We now have uh, over 100 uh, members. There are governments, the civil society, NGOs, academia research, but also multinational institutions and UN organizations like the FAO and World Bank are, are, are members. Uh, <coughs> the, the guidance is within these uh, clusters I just mentioned, but the work actually is done by, excuse me, by action networks. We have many action networks where technical work is being done, science-based evidence is created. Uh, I will not mention all of them, but we have one uh, closing the efficiency gap. We have one 
restoring value to grassland. <coughs> we have a global network on silver pastoral systems, a Dairy Asia partnership for health and prosperity. And recently, we also have uh, added an animal welfare action network and uh, action network on livestock uh, antimicrobial partnership. Uh, the global agenda of sustainable livestock has uh, linked its work very closely to the SDGs that was done uh, a year ago in, in Panama. And when we now look uh, what uh, this uh, agenda can do, it provides this platform uh, to share knowledge and to document and communicate cases of best practices and tools. We also develop and test and make available tools and guidance guidelines to measure practice change. A uh, person uh, recently in a uh, presentation said, you can't improve what you can't measure. So I think measurements are very important. And also engage in regional and national policy debates with decision makers to facilitate the development and implementation of enabling policies and enhance interactions with science and other related multi-stakeholder partnerships like, for instance, the GRA. When we now look uh, for examples, what is happening may be due to the work of the global agenda. We have to become more uh, active regionally and also locally. So, for instance, Mongolia as a country has joined the global agenda and now has started activities to create a national agenda for sustainable livestock stock, realizing that uh, it is not enough to develop a national livestock policy. This uh, <coughs> livestock policy has to be uh, enhanced by a multi-stakeholder approach. Another example, the Action Network Dairy Asia is making use of the global agenda principles to sustainably develop the dairy sector in Asia. And in Asia, we are talking mostly with uh, smallholders. <coughs> uh, the Action Network for Silver Pastoral System is showcasing practice change in Latin America and makes it available to other agroclimatic zones. Uh, the publications of the Livestock Environment Assessment Partnership, it has already been mentioned, uh, have proven to assist extension services and farmers to reduce their environmental impact and at the same time save money for those impacts. There are many more examples, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Fritz. Um, so now the floor is open to you. You've been listening patiently for an hour or so. We have um, 10 minutes until the next session begins. So let's say five minutes for questions from the floor um, to any of the panelists. Matthew, I'll see you then. Um, perhaps, uh, I'm not sure how to manage this. If there are microphones or someone could pass microphones around, if you could identify yourself and um, to whom you're asking your question. Thank you. First of all, Matthew, ready from... Uh, yeah, I guess there, or maybe there are some roving mics we can... Another one. Uh, thank you, Hayden, and thank you to all of the presenters. Uh, Matthew Reddy from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, brilliant presentations, and I really like the way that, uh, especially the presenter from Embrapa, talked about the systems approach to thinking beyond the cow and into that into the landscape. And hopefully, we can hear more about that. What I was really interested in is we talk about food, we talk about protein. What we don't talk about is agricultural value chains. Everyone in this room is wearing wool. Everyone in this room is wearing leather. The alternatives to this could be far worse for, for climate change. So I think we need to expand this conversation much more uh, into the, the value that livestock brings to, to more circular solutions for other sectors of the economy and, and sustainable uh, production as well, beyond uh, protein, and, um, uh, yeah, protein and food. Good point. Sorry. Any more? Yes, in the centre, yeah. It's on, okay. Um, Paulo Barreto, I'm from Brazil. Um, 
Fabiana mentioned the uh, system of carbon uh, neutral uh, beef. I would like to know what are the main challenges to scale up. You mentioned there are pilot projects, but of course it's, it's small. How what are the challenges to, to scale up this experience? Thank you. Okay, I will be talk <laughs> after, but I talk <laughs> also now. Uh, the big challenge is to bring the private sector uh, to us is to bring, is to combine the scientific uh, results with the private sector um, goals in Brazil. Because Brazil is a large country and we have several uh, biome and uh, all the types of soils and trees and uh, others. And the, the production systems, it's uh, also uh, various. We don't have uh, a particular production beef systems. And we have uh, a lot of breeds and a lot of uh, soils and a lot of uh, logistic problems. And uh, we are trying to uh, overspread this, this kind of, uh, of brand, this brand, it's a brand. And uh, we are trying with uh, research and with uh, a partners with a private partner and also with the support of the government. Thank you. Here in the front, please. Yes. Hello. Uh, thanks for very nice presentations. My name is Nahid Nagizadeh from Iran, from a civil society organization, Senesta, Center for Sustainable Development. We are working in Iran with the uh, mobile indigenous peoples and local communities over uh, decades. And uh, special thanks to the representative of uh, pastoralists from Germany for being a voice of those communities. Uh, unfortunately, in Iran, 2% of the uh, people are nomadic pastoralists, but the policies are in, in a, a tries to set and tries those communities. And uh, their territories has been taken by development projects. And I wonder if there are some international policies to enforce the national levels to support those communities as they have they have uh, mobility. And if they set and try them, then we have to uh, rely on industrial livestock. What is the international mechanisms to support those communities at national level and local level? Thank you so much. Um, do you want to have a present or Mark? Um, I, I can say a few words on this. Thank you for the question, a very relevant question, and, and for a good follow-up to, to Ruth's intervention. Um, the mobility uh, of, of pastoralists is, is uh, at stake at the moment, and it's, it's challenged by a number of things, uh, crop encroachment, conflicts, uh, land degradation, and so on. And, and this is a, a topic that uh, in FAO we are working on. Um, we know that, for example, I think it was last year, maybe two years ago, uh, the Nwakshot Declaration was uh, mentioning this, this, this problem and trying to create an international movement around, around this issue. Um, we also have a, uh, an initiative called the Pastoralist Knowledge Hub, working on mobility issues at the moment supported by FAO. Uh, for example, next week we will have a, a conference in Dakar uh, dealing especially with this problem of mobility where we're trying to bring together scientists and, and policy makers in order to, to tackle the issue of mobility and, and, and how to support pastoralists um, continue with their traditional uh, lifestyle and, and, and livelihoods uh, and adapting to, to new challenges. I hope this answers the, the question. Great. Thank you, Anne. I think we have two more questions, the two standing at the microphones, and then we'll have to draw it to a close, I'm afraid. So please, uh, in the centre. Hi, my question is for Fabiana. I'm from an NGO called Brighter Green in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I would like to know how the emissions and data is going to be tracked for this no carbon beef you're talking about. I went to an event, the Brazil Pavilion yesterday, where the NGOs were saying that they were not able to access information on emissions and farm data. So I'd like to know about that. And very quick point to the gentleman who mentioned clothing, I'm wearing a intentionally um, animal-free recycled material made in New York City coat and a bamboo scarf. And so 
I, I realize these are not options for everyone around the world, but I think a lot of people in this room can access, have access to these kind of materials. So it's very possible to not wear animals. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, we have a guideline, uh, a protocol to, to do this kind, to this brand. And this brand is a concept brand that uh, we have uh, af about 40 years of studies in the gas emissions in this kind of systems, these um, zero pastoral systems, mainly. Uh, and uh, we use for the, the calculus of the, of the emission and of the mitigation, we use or the IPCC levels for the emissions of the, the cattle, or our studies, because we have our results of, the, of our studies, because we have a, a big uh, uh, net in Brazil called, uh, uh, we have three big nets called uh, Fluxus, Pecus, and uh, I don't remember the other, sorry. But uh, we work um, very hard in a PECUS net that is the official governmental uh, research uh, that involves more than 1,000 uh, institutes and institu institu institutions. Uh, and uh, we measure and uh, the emissions from the cattle, from the soil, from the, the trees, from the systems, from the, the cultivations, and we have uh, this, these results. Um, the results, it's published in, uh, in the several journals, and uh, we have also in our website at Embrapa, you can find uh, www.embrapa, Dot, dot, dot br, br, and uh, you can find the results of this, these studies. And we use uh, these results, or EPCC, when the, we don't have uh, this, this date. Mark, you wanted to make a quick? Yeah, just a very quick comment, because I think it, it, it's another example of uh, kind of how technology can disrupt what we currently perceive to be. So we, you know, the, 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 the example was raised of, of leather and clothing, and the lady made you know, a very good uh, remark about, okay, but this is uh, from recycled materials, et cetera. But about six months ago, there was a fundamental tech breakthrough uh, in the US to actually be able in laboratories to produce leather without an animal. And now, not only does that mean you don't have an animal and, and the issues of how, how we manage animals uh, in a humane way. But it also gets to uh, the efficiency of uh, the leather clothing industry and the car industry, where currently, because leather comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes from different shaped animals, uh, there's an enormous amount of wastage. But with this uh, line production system, you can just produce it to exactly the size that you wanted and no animals involved, but it's still leather. So, you know, there's a huge tech disruption going on around us. Um, and I'd encourage us all to keep on going back to what exists outside of the ag sector for solutions uh, that can be delivered inside uh, the food sector and the clothing industry. Very good observation. Final question from the floor and the gentleman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Travis Frank from Climate Interactive. My question is at, uh, sort of maybe for the panel since I think this is hard to quantify, some of, the, some of you have made comments like this, but my question for your expert opinion is, what are emissions, absolute emissions, going to be in 2050 for the sector? In particular, Anne made the comment of when uh, intensity reduces, but, but the overall uh, absolute amount of livestock increases, which we're expecting globally, that the absolute emissions go up. So are we gonna be 10% higher than today, 30% uh, reduction below BAU, can someone, you know, what are your opinions about what we can really do? Ma'am? Thank you for the question. So um, the, the figures that everybody is using at the moment for what will be the size of the sector in 2050 is about plus 70% compared to 2005. Um, this is the, the reference figure from FAO published in 2012. Uh, we are now working on uh, revised estimates, and we believe they will be lower 
uh, than this. So we would probably be under plus 50% in our projections for how big the livestock sector will be in 2050 compared to, uh, uh, let's say, 2010 now. Um, this means that if we, um, this is the business as usual, if, if no progress is made, we'll have plus 50% of emissions. But uh, we know that progress uh, is being made already, has been made in the past. Uh, and if the current pace of improvements continues, we can expect emissions to rise by 20, 30% max. Uh, and that's without considering all the new progress that uh, we mentioned today without considering carbon storage in soils. Um, so um, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to give an absolute figure now, uh, but uh, we know that we are on the right path and, and that we can even improve this and maybe, maybe uh, become carbon neutral in the livestock sector as a whole if we combine all the solutions. Great, thank you very much, Anne. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'd like to thank the panelists for their excellent contributions and for being with us today. And maybe a round of applause for all of them for their uh, sharing their expertise and their experiences. Um, I think just for a quick summary, I would like to highlight is what we've heard today is I think the sheer diversity of livestock production systems um, make the challenge we have so enormous and I think we have challenges of scale both in the terms of the extensive nature of much of our production systems but also that much of the world's production is uh, from small scale production, small holders I should say, uh, which creates its own challenges around having the scale of resources necessary to, to implement some of these practices. Um, we've heard about the diversity of systems in Brazil, but that's just one country. Uh, you know, the different soil types, the different climates, the different animal species. Uh, all around the world and our livestock systems are so diverse and each have their own specific challenges. Then there's the cultural practices of how we manage our livestock and the value that livestock have in societies around the world. Um, we've heard about the role of livestock, both from a, I guess, a contribution towards driving climate change uh, in terms of its contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, but also the very important role livestock play and the, probably the fundamental role livestock play in actually providing food, fibre, fuel, draft, and other services to, to societies. Um, we've heard about uh, nutrition, malnutrition, uh, obesity, etc., and the role livestock play in each of those uh, challenges. We've heard about the impacts of climate change on livestock, which makes our task even more difficult to actually create more productive and resilient livestock systems. And we had a question earlier from Renee about, you know, can we have this uh, low carbon livestock future? Well, I think the answer is we must. Um, we know that a lot can be done. We've heard from the you know, government representatives, uh, the scientific community, our multilateral institutions, our representatives from the livestock sector. A lot of action is, is taking place. Of course we need more. We need scaling up, or I think it's called nowadays scaling out. I don't know when that happened, but it changed. Uh, and the role of the private sector, and I'm, I guess where I come from, farmers are the private sector, and I sometimes wonder why we separate farmers and then the private sector. Um, but we certainly need um, you know, those actors who are actually producing food and fibre and energy and draft and everything else to be the ones taking action, and they need support. And that's not just money, that's, that's knowledge, you know, that's policy settings. Um, and I mentioned earlier that with the known practices, we think we can get about maximum 40% of the way in terms of what livestock should contribute as part of that two-degree goal. So we need innovation, we need breakthrough, we need disruptive technologies that that Mark mentioned in terms of uh, producing leather or, or a leather substitute um, without having animals involved. So, you know, I think we need all of us to be working hand in hand to make this, uh, this future possible. And so with that, I'll, I'll stop and I'll just maybe invite, um, closing the circle, thinking about circular food systems, to our first speaker. Thomas, you mentioned, you know, from 450 kilometres away how fragile Earth is and how we're protected by a very thin bubble of blue that you, you could pop with a, with a pin, it seems, from, from the space station. What you've heard today, are you leaving here with more confidence about the future, or are you leaving uh, perhaps wanting to go back to the space station? <laughs> no, I am. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, uh, I'm reassured by the conversation. Uh, it's good to know that solutions exist, are being implemented, that other solutions are being considered. Uh, of course, there are still lots of problems that we've discussed today extensively, but I have a good confidence, I think, that uh, when I go back to space, if I do one day, then I'll see 
the change in action from the, the very local solutions uh, to, the, to the global result at the scale of the planet. Right. Well, thank you. Let's hope we can achieve it. Thank you, everyone.